NASA has officially acknowledged that its Parker Solar Probe dipped below the upper part of the Sun's atmosphere, known as the Corona, and touched the Sun. It actually made its momentous flight in April, but it took months for the data to relay back to Earth and for researchers to confirm their findings. Parker Solar Probe was launched in 2018 with its primary objective to probe the solar corona to learn more about the origin of solar wind. Since solar activity has a large effect on living on Earth, from generating auroras to threatening infrastructure like satellites, scientists want to know more about how the sun operates to make predictions about space weather. In its planned seven-year mission, it should be making a total of 26 close approaches to the sun, using a total of seven gravity assist maneuvers from Venus. The April perihelion was the eighth and the first to actually enter the corona. Parker could only spend around five hours in the corona due to the intense conditions there, but it did manage to go as low as 15 solar radii from the sun's surface. This time-lapse footage of the spacecraft's view as it swoops into the sun's corona is made up of individual images captured between August 8 and 12. All of those streaks the probe is zooming through are coronal streamers, massive loops of electrically charged gas and plasma that connect two regions of opposite polarity on the sun. They're extended out by the solar wind, and they glow like this, because they're filled with electrons. Parker is expected to creep even closer to the sun on future flybys, coming as low as 8.86 solar radii. Aside from being an awesome thing to do, the Parker Solar Probe's mission to touch the sun revealed new insights about the solar wind and its magnetic field. In 2019, Parker discovered that magnetic zigzag structures in the solar wind, called switchbacks, are plentiful close to the sun, but how and where they form remained a mystery. Now fresh findings suggest that switchbacks occur in patches and have a higher percentage of helium than other elements. If scientists could better understand the physics of switchbacks, this may also point to why the corona is millions of degrees Celsius, which is far above the temperature of the solar surface. Parker Solar Probe's next solar flyby is scheduled for late February 2022, although the spacecraft will gather observations for weeks before and after the closest approach. On Friday, December 17, NASA confirmed that the long-awaited James Webb Space Telescope is now scheduled to lift off from French Guiana no earlier than December 24, two days later than previously planned. According to NASA, engineers readying the telescope recently found that a cable relaying data between the telescope and the launch pad equipment wasn't functioning properly. Now that the communications problem has been resolved, NASA and the European Space Agency have rescheduled the launch to Friday. Webb, which was mounted onto the rocket earlier this week, was encapsulated inside Ariane 5 rocket's fairing on Friday. The fairing will protect the observatory during liftoff and the first few minutes of ascent through the atmosphere. A final launch readiness review will be held on Tuesday, December 21, to ensure the Webb Space Telescope is ready for launch. If so, its Ariane 5 rocket will roll out to the launch pad at the Guiana Space Center in French Guiana on Wednesday. Nearly two years have now come and gone since Boeing's Starliner spacecraft made its unsuccessful debut test flight, launching on December 20, 2019. Finally, there is some clarity about when the vehicle will launch again and attempt to dock with the International Space Station. Boeing and NASA had originally aimed to launch Starliner's second flight to the International Space Station, dubbed Orbital Test Flight 2, on July 30. But pre-flight checks revealed 13 stuck valves in Starliner's service module, nixing that liftoff plan. After extensive testing and analysis of faulty valves, company officials announced on December 13 that the team aims to relaunch the Starliner on its second orbital flight test in May 2022. Over the past four months, teams conducted extensive analysis on the valves, and on Monday, NASA announced that the most probable cause for the faulty valve is related to oxidizer and moisture interactions, and Boeing has decided to replace the troubled service module with a new one. The service module originally planned for its crew flight test will now be used for the orbital flight test too, and the service module planned for the Starliner 1 flight will be used for crew flight test. It was not clear from NASA's and Boeing's press releases what fate awaits the service module with faulty valves, which would be a costly loss. NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft are undergoing integrated testing inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to ensure they are go for launch of the Artemis 1 mission. During a recent core stage power test, engineers identified an issue with one of the RS-25 engine flight controllers. The flight controller works as the brain for each RS-25 engine, communicating with the SLS rocket to provide precision control of the engine, as well as internal health diagnostics. Each controller is equipped with two channels, so that there is a backup in case one of the channels fails during launch or ascent. In the recent testing, channel B of the controller on engine 4 failed to power up consistently. 
After performing a series of inspections and troubleshooting, engineers determined the best course of action is to replace the engine controller. NASA is developing a plan and updated schedule to replace the engine controller while continuing integrated testing and reviewing launch opportunities in March and April. Integrated testing will culminate with the wet dress rehearsal at historic Launch Complex 39B. NASA will set a target launch date after a successful wet dress rehearsal test. NASA has selected Axiom Space for the second private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Axiom has partnered with SpaceX to launch four crewed missions to the International Space Station using Crew Dragon capsules and Falcon 9 rockets. Axiom will work with NASA to find a window for the company's second ISS mission, known as AX-2, which is currently scheduled to launch from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in late 2022. The first of these flights, AX-1, is set to take off on 21 February 2022. Michael Lopez Alegria, a former NASA astronaut who now works for Axiom, will pilot it. He will be joined by three space tourists, each of whom paid $55 million to participate in the eight-day mission. Peggy Whitson, a record-breaking former NASA astronaut and current Axiom employee, will command AX-2 for no more than 14 days. According to Axiom representatives, one of her three crewmates will be John Schaffner, an auto racer, pilot, and investor. The identities of the other two crew members have yet to be revealed. NASA and Axiom will negotiate in-orbit activities for the private astronauts to conduct in coordination with space station crew members and flight controllers on the ground. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Even though Starship 20 has been sitting idle for the past two weeks or so without any ground test activities, the past week has seen some unexpected changes in the ship's body. Crane lift hardpoints on Ship 20's nose cone were removed on December 15 to install heat tiles on those locations. This surprised many onlookers as Ship 20 is still in the suborbital launch pad B, and a crane is necessary to remove the ship from the pad. Surprisingly, Starship has additional load points under its forward flaps that have never been employed before. It is now assumed that a crane will connect to these load points and lift Ship 20 from the suborbital launch pad. Then, either the booster catching arm or the crane itself will stack the ship atop the booster. But since the Lieber LR11350 crane used for stacking in August was decommissioned, and SpaceX does not have a similar crane on site, it is more likely that the ship will be lifted with the help of the booster catching arm. Similar load points can also be spotted on super heavy booster prototypes. To raise the booster above the orbital launch mount, the upper lift rail on the catching arm will be attached to the upper load points, and the vertical stabilizer will be attached to the lower load points on the booster. Four orange cylindrical devices were spotted on the ship recently, two of which were installed in late November, and the other two last week. These will most probably be the underwater locator beacons, also known as black box pingers, that guide search and rescue teams to a submerged aircraft by emitting a repeated electronic pulse. These beacons will help to locate Starship 20 once it performs a targeted ocean landing approximately 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of Kauai during its orbital test flight. An underwater beacon is typically supplied with electrical power by a lithium battery. Once the beacon becomes immersed into water, a built-in water switch activates it via the water's presence, completing an electrical circuit, and the beacon will start emitting its pings. The search personnel can then use a special receiver to locate the ship. A pinger can transmit signals from depths as low as 6 kilometers underwater. On Monday, December 13, Super Heavy Booster 4 was safely extracted from the stand and installed on the orbital launch mount for the third time. Four days later, on December 17, SpaceX performed the first cryogenic proof test of Booster 4. During the cryogenic proof test, Booster 4 was filled with liquid nitrogen, which is used to pressurize the rocket's tanks to simulate the high stress it would experience once filled with subcooled propellant. The vehicle started to develop frost and released white clouds as the cryogenic proof was performed. This test was a little different from any of the previous cryoproof tests. The liquid nitrogen for the proof test was supplied by SpaceX's custom-built storage tanks at the tank farm, and this is the first time the tank farm was utilized for a super-heavy cryoproof test. This is also the first time the booster quick disconnect mechanism has been put into operation. If engineers gathered enough data from the proof test, they could move on to conduct a static fire test of Booster 4's powerful Raptor engines to assess their performance. Road closures are scheduled till the end of this month, signaling an upcoming test campaign. On Friday, Elon Musk posted a short video on his Twitter page showing us a test of the steering of the Raptor engines of Booster 4. Generally, rockets make use of gimbaled thrust for navigation. 
In such a system, the engine can be swiveled from side to side, resulting in the change of thrust direction relative to the rocket's center of gravity. In a super heavy booster, inner nine Raptor engines can be pivoted around two axes of freedom with a range of 15 degrees. In a subsequent tweet, Musk clarified that so far they have installed the first-generation Raptor engines on the Starship and the Super Heavy launch vehicle, and each one of those engines can produce 185 metric tons, or 1.81 meganewtons of thrust. He added that the second-generation Raptors have already been put into production, and they can produce more than 230 metric tons, or 2.25 meganewtons of thrust. Recently there was a rumor that Ship 20 and Booster 4 would not be launched into orbit, but Musk confirmed that they are still aiming for Booster 4 and Ship 20 for the first orbital test flight. On December 15, NASA announced that the agency is preparing to conduct environmental assessments to develop a proposed new launch site, Launch Complex 49, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The 175-acre site would support the launch and landing of Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicles. According to NASA, LC-49 has been a part of Kennedy's master plan for several years, and they will begin interagency and public scoping for the proposed environmental assessment in early 2022. While it was expected for SpaceX to launch Starship from Florida eventually, it was uncertain where specifically the company would launch from. The orbital launch pad at LC-39A could absolutely support these launches, but more launch pads would allow SpaceX to increase launch cadence, which is especially important if SpaceX wants to launch Starship every two weeks. As a result, it is more likely that this pad would be developed alongside the Starship launch mount at LC-39A, rather than replacing it. According to Elon Musk, a Starship launch from Cape Canaveral is expected to happen in the third quarter of 2022. On December 8, Super Heavy Booster 5, the second orbital class Super Heavy prototype, was taken out of the high bay and moved to a display stand near the build site. At that time, it was widely believed that this was to free up the space inside the high bay to stack Starship 21. But rumors are circulating that Booster 5 will not fly, and SpaceX plans to scrap the booster. Although we have no official confirmation, recently, Elon Musk tweeted that the next booster will have 33 Raptor version 2 engines. Booster 5 is a 29-engine prototype, so there is a chance that after Booster 4, the next booster to arrive at the launch site will be an upgraded prototype with 33 engines and several other design changes. SpaceX is currently building a booster test tank labeled Booster 6 at the build site, so the next full-scale booster prototype might be Booster 7. Meanwhile, the tank section of Starship 21 was relocated to the high bay for stacking operations. Ship 21's nose cone is currently standing outside the high bay, ready to be lifted on top of the tank section. Along with updates on booster upgrades, Musk officially confirmed that the Starship is being upgraded to nine engines, with an increased propellant load. Out of this, six will be vacuum-optimized engines, and three will be sea-level engines with the ability to gimmel. He added that the propellant tanks would be extended to store more propellants. In a separate tweet, Musk mentioned that SpaceX is starting a program to take carbon dioxide out of atmosphere and turn it into rocket fuel, a process that will also be important for Mars. What he mentioned in his tweet was the Sabatier process, which involves producing methane and water from a reaction of hydrogen with carbon dioxide at elevated temperatures and pressures in the presence of a nickel catalyst. Finding a way to capture CO2 from a planet's atmosphere can help solve global warming on Earth and enable SpaceX to build a propellant plant on Mars to create Raptor engine fuel through the Sabatier process. If SpaceX achieves developing carbon capturing technology, Starship could become a carbon-neutral rocket long-term. At the build site, SpaceX is preparing for a first-of-its-kind ground test. The so-called Can Crusher was recently installed on the top of Booster Test Tank 2.1. From below, 20 ropes are expected to pull on the top of the test tank, crushing it until it deforms. This would allow SpaceX to simulate the forces that a vehicle would experience during the flight. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.